This engine is the Mariner 32 stroke long shaft. It's a 2003 and it's in for an annual service or a 100 hour service. This Mariner 30 is the equivalent of a Tahatsu 30. Most of the parts are interchangeable and when we take it apart we'll see that there are similarities between the Tahatsu and the Mariner. So we'll just take the cowl off first, that's done by lowering this handle and then the lid comes off. There is an option for this engine to be electric start but this is a tiller with manual start. Just removing the cowl in there and you can see the insides. We'll see if your engine looks similar to this then it's a likely candidate that's the same type. It's the two cylinder version with a single carburetor on the front. So this service, what we're going to do first, we're going to change this fuel filter. I actually do have a new designed fuel filter, it's a, it's a superseded part. So we'll take it off, it's held on here with a, with a, with a nut, I'm using a 13mm spanner. We'll take it off, take those two fuel lines off and then we'll put the new one on, it's a, it's a direct swap basically. And here is the new fuel filter, it's a cartridge insert so you can remove this lower plastic housing and there's an insert that can be changed every year instead of changing the whole housing. The reason I'm going for this one is the current filter, It's uh, the part's been superseded, you can't really get it. And if you can, it's really expensive and this whole housing, including the filter, is cheaper than the cartridge of that one that's already on. So I'll whiz that off and I'll show you what it looks like once it's on. Another thing to note, the fuel, the fuel lines, they have got arrows on them showing you which way the flow is and it's just push fitting. Should be the same size as the one that's coming off since it's a superseded part. So that's where it came out of. It's just a cut out on that bracket so you don't have to remove the nut fully, it's just a clamp. Two fuel hoses here. Here's a comparison, the old one and the new one. Fair difference in size, better better fuel flow, better filtration. All, all in all, this is a better fuel filter. So for refitting, I've removed the nut and washers off this one. And the nut off this one doesn't come with washers, but I'm going to use the two washers on the new one. I might even use the, the nut since it's like a, a brass nut. And just in case of putting it back on, like I say, a few hoses, make sure you get them the right way around. It's easy as that. And there we have it new fuel filter fitted, two new clips as well, and it's secured on the top there. Sandwich top and bottom with the washer. I've just taken the old one apart and the filter is that mesh screen there. Obviously that can be washed out and put back in. Got the fuel bowl there, a bit of sediment in the bottom, housing the top and an o-ring. So next on the service list with the spark plugs, top and bottom cylinder. Obviously it's a two cylinder engine. Single coil pack feeding the two. So just a case of popping the spark plug boots off removing them, fitting the new spark plugs. We do have a handy little sheet here, given the part number, BR7HS-10, and it's gapped to one mil. So there's our two spark plugs removed. They are in quite good condition. So very little running. As you can see here, that's where we've removed them from. So we'll see important to make note of which HT lead goes where. On this case it's pretty self-explanatory. We've got a short one which will only reach the top and a long one which will reach top and bottom but it's obviously for the bottom one since the top one doesn't reach the bottom. It's straightforward on a single cylinder this engine but when you start getting the multi-bank cylinders V6s and all that even even the four cylinders it can get confusing so the best thing to do where the HT lead comes into the coil pack so ah. just make a note, bit of tip X a pen, say like cylinder one, two, three, four. Just stops all the confusion later on. So I'm just going to perform a cylinder compression test now. So where the spark plugs go in, I've, a, I've fitted a spark plug compression tester. This is a Kennedy. And we're just going to measure compression in PSI. We're just looking for a uniform um, pressure over both cylinders within 10-15%. A tip when you do this, I've taken both spark plugs out, obviously we need to fit the compression tester at the top one, 
remove the bottom plug it reduces compression over the over the whole engine makes it easier to pull I have sprayed a tiny bit of WD-40 in just because I'm not showing the last time this engine was run um, so the lubrication inside the cylinders might be a bit lacking so everything just to give us a helping hand and obviously the, the kill cord is removed so there's no spark so we've given it a few pulls there and we're up to what's that 10, 20, 30 132 psi on the top cylinder pressure relief there remove that one we'll put it in the bottom one and we'll pull it again so here's the bottom cylinder and we're looking about the one, 129 130 mark so overall both cylinders are bang on what we'll do now we'll reinstall reinstall the two new spark plugs to this setting here so i've got two brand new spark plugs i have checked the gap on them and we'll just reinstall these the same as the ones that have been removed and then put your ht leads on top of the spark plug and that's as simple as changing the spark plug so obviously on a spark plug when it says like one mil what we're doing is we're getting the feeler gauge set here we're looking for one and we're running that blade between the gap here that's the spark plug gap and we're looking for light resistance and that's the set gap another tip when you're installing spark plugs I always like to start the threads off by hand, if possible, obviously some of them are recessed into the head. Snug them down as far as you can by hand, just, you don't want to cross thread them. And then once they're snug down, get your socket on them and give them a nip up. This engine, like many larger engines, also has a thermostat. The thermostat's found on the cylinder head top, which is here. It's two M10, well, 10 mil socket head bolts that are holding it on and some clips holding cables so we'll just move them out of the way so we'll remove both of these and we'll remove the thermostat so there we go i've taken both bolts out you had one there one there someone's obviously doing maintenance to this engine because there's some fresh grease on the bolts so hopefully someone's been maintaining the thermostat so just take the lid off there some clean inside Clean the faces up, obviously. And there we are, there's the thermostat. No gasket, for some reason. The person who did it decided not to use a gasket. Which is probably why they've used that grease or instant gasket. And then, oh no, there is a gasket, just couldn't see it. There's the old gasket, I've got a, I've got a new one. And then we just pull the thermostat out. Quite a bit of that grease instant gasket on that. I'll give it a clean up and we'll test it in some hot water. Another thing, when you're looking inside the thermostat housing, you just, just check the condition. You're looking for like loads of salt buildup and all that. It just gives you a good indication as to what's happening inside the block. This one looks pretty clean. And again, on the thermostat itself, it's apart from that gunk, it's pretty clean. There's no corrosion or buildup on it. Also, it gets flushed out periodically with fresh water or it's operating in sort of like a nice clean, clean water. So for testing, if you haven't already seen me test one of these before, we've got the thermostat in here, I'm going to put some hot water in, and we're just checking for operation. I know you're supposed to use a thermometer and check the temperature against the book and all that, but we're literally just seeing if it operates. So we put it in the hot water, and you're looking for it to, to open on top. You can actually hear it expanding, that's the spring. Compressing. And you can see there at the top that the valve is open. When it cools down, that valve will retract and seal again. You'll see in the bottom here is like a, a temperature sensitive medium, like a wax. And when, when it gets hot, it expands and pushes up on that valve and the spring when it contracts, closes again. Pretty simple, but if they fail, quite often fail shut and you can get overheating issues. 
So that means they fail open. I've seen that before as well. They just, they just get clogged up around that seat. But I'm happy with that. That's operating. So we'll reinstall that with a new gasket. We'll clean the faces up on the on the cylinder head top. Just before we clean the face up, what I want you to see is that's the Mariner gasket. And I'm seeing these are Tohatsu engines as well. If you look at the thermostat cover, obviously apart from the top being square, it's the exact same part. So we'll just go ahead now with a razor blade and I'll clean as much as this of this gun cuff as we can. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get all of it. Most of it's actually recessed in. I'll get a cloth, give that a wipe, but the faces are actually clean. And I'll do the same on this thermostat cover. It looks pretty clean. I'll give it a once over and then hit it with a cloth and then we'll reinstall it all. There we go, with the thermostat in there, got the new gasket on. Got the thermostat cover, and that just drops onto there. See the two bolts go in, and the two clips which go on the the bolts as well. And that'll be it for the thermostat. And that's it there. Both bolts are on, covers on, new gasket. Just put these clips on. So for a top end service, that's pretty much it on this engine. Obviously, we've got all the the linkages to grease up and all that. Basically, any, any pivot points, we're going to grease and check connections, like these ball connections and everything. But you don't need to see how to grease linkages, because it's, it's literally just applying grease to the bits and pieces. If there's too much, we'll remove it. Checking clips, like that one there is not... Well, it is, but we can bend it a little bit more. Um, any corrosion, dealing with that, scraping it off. Yeah, the next the next thing to do is the lower unit gearbox. So for lowering the lower unit on this engine, it's a long shaft. I've got it tilted back. So what we've done is we've lifted it up, locked it off. The disconnection on the Mariner Tohatsu is here. It's two roll pins. Remove the top one. I've got some drifts. I'll show you what size it is. Coming back here. I've got mirror image two bolts. There may or may not be one, sometimes hidden within the trim or anode. We'll have a look, we'll remove it anyway and give it a clean up inside. While we're back here we can look at the condition of the prop. Now the prop is, it's not good, it's got a huge chunk out of it here. This one's all scuffed and marred and this one's got chunks out of it as well. It looks like it's hit the bottom, hit a rock, an obstacle, but it definitely needs replacing. I've recommended the customer to replace this, but it's up to him. To remove it, there's a split pin that's already been removed, and a castle nut. It's already been slackened off because the prop's been off before. So you just remove that. You've got to a washer, spacer, I mean, I'll just lift the prop fully up and it's off. Got thrust washer behind here. And on the underside, you can see it's a rubberized hub inside. Just remove that, Let's just get a bit of weight off. When we come to do the gearbox oil, we've got the drain and the fill is here. But what we'll do, we'll remove this lower section first and we'll tackle the water pump. Another good tip when you're working with lower units, when you remove your prop, just put the castle nut back on so it protects the, the top of the threads there. It doesn't take much just to damage that and you'll never get it back on, you have to run a, a die over it. But just put that on there, just gives you that bit of extra protection. So before we take any of these bolts out, these rule pins, I'm going to hit it with some PB Blaster penetrating oil. Just let that soak in. It just helps if there's anything. Get these two bolts on that side as well. Anything stuck. And we'll let that soak in. I'm more concerned about these roll pins on this side, but I'm sure we'll get them out. 
these ones not so much, but it's best just to give them a bit of penetrating oil. And we'll let that sit for 10 minutes, then we'll remove them. So for removing the roll pin, I've got a, a 3 30 second drift, or 2.4 mil. I've been informed that it's just the top one that needs to be removed, and it's just a case of putting your drift in, firm tap with a hammer, it should fire out. Got a bottom one here as well. If it comes to it, I don't see why you couldn't remove the bottom one, but I've been told online it's the top one to remove, so I'm going to go ahead and punch that one out, and then we'll take these bolts out on the lower unit, there's four, and then we'll drop the, oh, there could be a fifth one here, sorry, on the back there, on the cavitation, didn't see that one, the four bolts, and then this aft one here. I don't see there being one in this top section because if you look at the case and the casing doesn't penetrate into this um, joint. So I'm pretty happy that it's just these four, well, two on this side, two on the other, making four, and the fifth one is here. And this bit. Get this out first because if you remove these bolts, you're basically hanging on this, this joint. You don't want that to happen. Remove that penetrating oil just to free it off a bit. And then get to those bolts. So I did the drift off camera, it's just easier that way, as you can see, 2.4, 3 30 seconds goes through, just lovely. The next size up, you know, you've got 3 mil, 3 mil drill bit, I don't think you're going to get through because there's not much clearance on 2.4, but we get 2.5. So I just popped the back bolt out there, as you can see there it is, it's quite dry, no grease on that. So there's, I've got no service information from the customer as to when it was last serviced. He's not had it that long, so he's not sure himself. He said it came from a commercial business. So I assume it's been maintained annually, but without any documentation, it's hard to tell. And the thing is, if it's been sitting in storage, I mean, yeah, okay, right. that could that could account for why it's, the paintwork's in good condition, but then parts just deteriorate, they're not getting used. I mean, we'll soon see with the Impeller, if it's been used or not. Um, could be missing some pieces, but the only way to tell is to drop the lower unit, which is what we're doing. Also, these bolts, if I hadn't already said, I'm using a 13mm socket. What I like to do, I've taken the aft one out, and I like to go around and just crack off each and every one of them, just to make sure they're all free, and then I'll remove them all. Before we actually remove all, all of them, I normally drop them down, a um, couple of thread protruding, and I like to try and tap the uh, the cavitation plate just to just to get a, a joint appearing or, a, or an air gap appearing, just so I know it's free from the power head, the drive shaft. Otherwise, you take all the bolts out, it's free. You start whacking it, and all of a sudden, the whole thing just goes down. It's the it's the concrete, and you damage your leg, which is sort of what happens there. I imagine that's that's not from that. It's probably just from hitting a rock or something like that, but. So like I said, take the bolts out just far enough so you've got a bit of thread protruding on each one. And then with a soft face mallet, just work around so you're looking for an air gap, which is going to take up the slack, what you've taken out here. And that means you know that the, the drive shaft is free from the power head and it's not bound up. Which is a good reason why you always remove your roll pin from here, otherwise you'll just be yanking on this shifter. So I'll actually give it some light. All it took was some light taps, and you can see now we've got an air gap. We can actually see through through the lower unit case in there. So I'm happy with that. We've actually dropped down the drift pin on the uh, on that connection where I took the drift pin out because you can see clean metal now from where it was all tarnished. I'm happy with that. So what we'll do now, I'll take out all the bolts. I'll just leave one in as a security measure, and then when I'm happy, I'll remove that. We'll lower it down, and we'll put it into the bench there. Okay, so off camera there, I just pulled it out. See there's the drive shaft, it's lined at the top. That's it out. And that's the insides there. See that, that's the water pickup tube. That's actually quite a good design because that's a, it's a fixed one. Some of the ones that they just flop around and you've got to, you've got to try and align that where that one's, it's fixed into a housing. 
course, and then it just pushes into there. So then you've only, only got to worry about aligning this and this. So for servicing the water pump, so we've got the water pump housing here, drive shaft, which is driving the impeller. It's held on with four M10 bolts. Once you remove them, the whole thing slides up off the shaft. And then inside you've got gaskets, there's a, a cam key um, that holds the impeller to the shaft. We'll get to it. This is obviously here your shift selector. It's a vertical selector. So I'll see if I can hold the GoPro here while I take off these four bolts. It's nicely braced in the workbench here. So like I say, 10mm socket on these four. What I like to do is I always like to slacken each one off first, just to make sure none of them are bound up. That one's quite slack. There we go. Another good tip when you're doing a lower unit is if you can help it, and it's easier said than done, easier with the shifter. Obviously don't change the position it's in. It's not the end of the world, but if you're not familiar with how outboards operate or how to service them, then it can get a bit awkward. Also this one's pretty easy because it's a shifter, it's got three positions, a head, neutral, stern. The ones that are rotating collars can be a bit more difficult because you can miss a tooth, you know, sort of misalign the spline alignment. This one you can't really, it'll only go on one way because we've held it on. Same goes for the drive shaft, if you can help it, which is easier said than done, don't rotate it. Obviously it's in neutral so we can turn the prop shaft as much as we want, but the, the, like the drive shaft, because at the moment it's aligned with the engine head still. Obviously if we don't change, turn the flywheel, we don't turn this, in theory it should just go in as it came out. But with all things, when you're trying to get the cam in or the, the keyway, you can misalign the, this, this, uh, this spline here. Not the end of the world, because all you do is you just grip it and just give it a slight twist. All you're doing is just turning to mesh these teeth together with the spline. It's a female on the, on the power head. This is a male. Let's say, not the end of the world. It's just, it can make life a bit more difficult if you're not familiar with how it goes together. And then you start ramming it in, you get frustrated, especially if it's a heavy unit. This isn't particularly heavy. It's just long. Not the longest though, but it can be because you're trying to push this in and you, like I say, you're trying to align this and sometimes the smaller ones, these are free floating as well. It can just, the whole thing, you're trying to align three things together at once. Just take your time, make note of what you do and you should be all right. And to save time, I brought the electric ratchet. Let's see if I can get one on there. Makes life so much easier. So all four bolts are out, and we'll do the lift together. I don't know what's in here. There might not be any impeller left, or it might be brand new. So we'll just give it a wobble. You want to break the, the seal. There we go, it's coming up. Looks like the impeller's coming with the housing. Comes off and over. And there we go, we can see inside there. First glance, it's pretty good. It actually looks, I mean there's a bit of wear on the wear plate, which is this whole point by the name of it, the wear plate. But looking inside there, the housing, like the insert, that you, you see that chrome insert. I'd say that's pretty new that. I reckon the last service it had a, a new water pump housing put in. Obviously the, the outer, like, I mean by housing I mean like the insert. So we'll pop the impeller out. We've got a new gasket, the slower gasket here, and there is the the keyway. Some of my cams, this is the keyway. Just a cut, just a notch cut out of the the, prop, the drive shaft, and then there's a keyway pushed in. Just be careful because they can fall out. Normally, a good tip if they do and you haven't struggled, you struggle to put them in. Bit of bit of grease just to stick them in. So before we take it out, you notice the the pump direction of the veins there simple case of looks like the inserts coming out with it but we'll just pull the impeller out not that hard just just twist it in the direction of the blades we can check the inside of this chrome housing here 
so this looks fairly new just a bit of surface tarnish on the inside there I would say the last time this had an impeller this was brand new um, not to say that it was last year it's just I don't think it's had much use since it's had one of these check the impeller here and check the veins checking each one and what we're doing is we're looking along the lead and at the tips and we're just checking each one to make sure there's it's all intact basically because if if pieces come off then the chances are it's somewhere in the power head normally normally it's not normally they're still inside the the uh, the water pump housing but Oh, I found them before in the in the thermostat um, housing, but it depends on the setup. Here it is. Here's the new one. We'll just compare it with the old one, and that is pretty much bang on. So I'm happy with that. I'd say these are the Hatsu parts. There's the the gasket which is going to mate onto there. So we'll take the old one off, clean the faces up, put this new gasket down and then reinstall it all. Alright there we go, so there's the, the lower little wear plate. Remove the gasket. Uh, took some doing, I don't know if it was stuck down with some sort of glue or adhesive, but normally they just pop off, but this one I had to scrape off with a, with a Stanley blade. The new one, just in case of lowering it down, you've got dowels here, which sort of align with it. One there, one there, you can't go on the wrong way. Kiwi, put the kiwi back in with the prot with the impeller, and then the housing comes down on top of that. So here we go, here's the new gasket. In this case of put it over the top, lower it down, and it aligns. So with the impeller, I always like to drop the impellers on. You can see there there's a notch cut into the impeller. We've got the keyway. I'll just grab the keyway there. It's like a, like a half moon. In a full rebuild kit, you will get a new uh, keyway. And I do this off camera because it's going to be tricky doing it with one hand. But I might be able to get away with it. Like I say, if, if you can't keep it in, just put a bit of grease in there. So you can see there the keyway is in. We're going to align the impeller with it. And there we go. It's as simple as just pushing it down. It's hardly any resistance with it. I'm just going to realign that gasket there. Just stuck there on that dowel. There. And then just, just move the key the, the impeller just slightly so you know it's locked. There we go. It hasn't fallen out or anything like that. So now when the engine's turning, obviously this this shaft turns regardless where the engine's in the head neutral or astern, but it's direct drive. It's the gearbox post this shaft in here, which does the direction on the prop. This is always turning. And that's what gives it its drive. Now, I'm never a believer of putting the impellers and these housings dry on the first run. So I've got some marine grease, which is just the Quicksilver 24C. Tiniest smearing all the way around the inside there. See, so it puts on the outside as well. So you don't want too much, just the, the lightest of smearings on the inside there. So now I put the housing on top, and it's just a case of you can rotate. I always rotate the pump housing in the same direction as it came off in, just to compress the veins there, and you can align it with the dowels and put the, um, the four bolts back in. So we go, I just pushed it down, just give it a slight twist to align the blades. It's all seating correctly, it's all fixed and firm, the gasket's correct, it's at the correct orientation. Put the four bolts, we'll put a bit of grease on those bolts because they came out dry, and then just tighten them down. So there we are, four bolts in, put the quicksilver grease on them, and then it's just, a, like I say, just a case of Start them off, wind them down, and tighten them up. So there we go, that's the water impeller serviced. 
just clean these top splines off, put a bit of a grease on there as well, just to stop it binding in the power head when we put it back in. Anything else that needs to be done, cleaning up around these seals can be done now, otherwise it's back on the engine. Here he is. Loves an engine. So like I mentioned, that's it ready to go back in. In theory, nothing's been changed position-wise for the drive shaft. So it should just slide straight back in. Once it's in, we'll check that the shifter is connected. And then we'll get one bolt in. Just on, just start under the threads. Just to hold it in position while we check everything. almost feel when it goes in properly because you feel the you feel the spines mesh at the top before we go too far in I've just made sure that the uh, the shift has went in to the housing there got a bit of a gap which is good and that's it pushed firm and all the way up what we'll do now is we'll get one bolt in any of the four or the five bolts just to secure it and so it's not going to go anywhere so the last thing we want to do is just think, oh, well, it's in, because it'll stay there if I don't hold it. And then for the whole thing just to slide out and smash, crack the case. So there we go. I've just got one bolt started off there. You can see the thread going through. And that's it secure. I know it's not going to drop anywhere. It's not the heaviest of gearboxes. So I know it's not going to pull the thread out. And we can just check it, make sure everything's aligned. Making sure this is aligned, which it is. Nothing looks untoward. You know, we haven't missed we haven't missed anything all looks good to me so we'll go ahead I'll put all all five bolts in now and then the roll pin in the back obviously we'll put a bit of grease on all the all five bolts because they did come out dry we don't want them to bind up in future so put a bit of that uh, quicksilver grease on and put all five in and then that's the lower unit secured back onto the engine so there we have it all five bolts are now on. Got the two here, two on the other side, and this aft one. We'll lower the engine back down now, and we'll drain the gearbox oil out, and then pressure test it. So the last job for us on here is the roll pin insertion. So I've got my drift. I'm just going to put that through there. You can see that that meshed very nicely through the hole. And we can just check it on the gear. Up, neutral, reverse there. And you can see that it's taken it. So we know that's aligned. We can take that out and we can push the roll pin back through. Now, you'll probably find that you'll get the roll pin probably a quarter of the way in, maybe it's halfway in. Once it's nearly in, just use some um, some large pliers and you can just like basically press it in. Uh, I suppose you could use the back of the drift and sort of tap it in but you could probably you might end up tapping it all the way through again on, on the other side so I don't normally just use some large grips just press it in there we go I've just pressed it in I use these you just press it in then just squeeze and then also just check your gear in again so just load the engine back down into the vertical and we're going to go ahead and remove the upper and lower oil drain plugs. So if there's another tip I can give you for doing the, the gearbox oil, always do the top one first. Release this one and then the bottom one, because the worst thing you can do is remove the bottom one and it comes out. The oil starts coming out and then you find that this one is stuck beyond belief and it won't come out because you'll never get the oil back in through the bottom because you need to purge the air out at the top. Same for filling it because obviously you fill it from the bottom as you pump the oil in it pushes all the air out and then it comes out the top. You put the top plug in, creates a partial vacuum so when you remove the oil filler it doesn't all just come out in one big go, it sort of glugs out really slowly. 
So always see if you can get this one out first and then the bottom one. So here we go, it's just a big flat blade, get it in there and then just a twist, there we go, see, it's coming. So then we'll do the bottom one now. So to get to this one, I've just rested the engine's skeg on the, the workbench so we can get to it and remove it. So the lower one is, is proven to be a bit difficult to get out. So what I've got here to aid us is a impact driver. You strike it on the back of the, with a hammer and you've got some large pieces here. It's basically an impact gun, but a manual one. Always works, always does the trick. So the way it works, always, see, always pick your bit that's snug. Don't fit a, don't get a loose one. And then you fit it into the impact driver. Fit it into the socket there and then just give it a good tap. And as you can see there now, it's coming out. We'll get the, the drain bowl under that. You see that was the other way around and you didn't have that and that one came out free first. And then you realise that that one wouldn't come out and you marred it all up and you didn't have an impact driver. That's the problem you come into. Sometimes these have magnets on the base of the, the lower one to collect any, any gunk, but that one hasn't got one. Oil's looking quite white as well, which is a sign of water getting in. Just removing, just remove the top one there as well. As you can see, here's the gearbox oil coming out. Seems quite emulsified. But we'll let that drain down for 10 minutes and we'll do a pressure test. So as you can see, it looks a bit emulsified, that oil that's come out. What that means is this water got in somehow through the seals, could be the, the drive shaft, the gear shifter, prop shaft, either one of the two fillers. Um, yes, yeah, so there's obviously a bit of water and moisture getting in. What we'll do, I'll plug the bottom one and we'll pressure test from the top, just so it keeps the pressure tester clear of oil. Take it at the 10 psi on pressure and then on vacuum, and we'll just see if it holds. If it holds, then we know the seals are good, and it could just be old oil, deteriorated oil, contaminated oil. We don't know the history. This is the pressure tester I've got. You've got a gauge on there showing pressure, vacuum. It's hand actuated, and I've got some fittings on there for gearbox, for outboard gearboxes, for like Japanese models, American models. There's only ever really two fittings. We've got this adapter with the adapter off, like a standard fit. So you can see this engine uses the adapter, being a Japanese build engine. This is the Japanese adapter. And I'll put the bottom plug in and then we'll give it a pump. So there we go, I've got the bottom plug in there. It's connected. And now it's just a case of pumping. So we can see I pumped it of the 10 psi and what we'll do we'll hold that pressure for about a minute um, normally it's 30 seconds but I'm gonna do a minute because we have got a bit of contamination in the oil and I just want to see if there is a slow leak I mean 10 psi I don't think the gearbox would ever experience 10 psi if this passes we'll then do uh, the vacuum same at, uh, minus 10 psi first glance this one looks all right on the pressure side. The reason we do both vacuum and pressure is because it's a double lip seal. Go back to back lip seals because what you're doing is not only are you holding the oil in here you don't want it to go out you also don't want the seawater to come in. So on the pressure side that's probably right because we'll pressurize the gearbox to prevent the oil from leaving the gearbox. Now there's water in so the likelihood is that on the vacuum side there might be a leak. But I've seen it before and probably on this one where we'll test it and there won't be. And it's just a, the oil degrades, you get 
condensation form. It could be a multitude of things. Um, the oil could have been bad before it went in. You never know. Here we are. We're at minus 10 psi under vacuum. And we're going to hold it for another minute on the slower gearbox unit. At the moment, it's holding. So the chances are it's probably just old oil. You know, over time, yeah, right, you might get a slight leak, but it looks like it's been stored. This engine, the shore, hasn't been stored in, in water or anything, but who knows? There's no history with it. We can only do what we can do. We test it, pressure, vacuum, put new gearbox oil in, and that's it. I mean, it could have been when that um, that prop there got damaged, it could have jarred the lip seal on the on the shaft here and just a little bit of water got squirted in. It could be something as simple as that. You never know. And we haven't lost any pressure. So I'm happy that the all seals are solid on this engine. We'll disconnect all this now. We'll drain the remainder out if there's any left. Don't think there's much left in. And then we'll pump up on the new gearbox oil. While we're waiting there, I'll put some new seals on the uh, drain fill plugs as well. So here's the brand of gearbox oil I'm using, it's the Quicksilver. It's not the high performance as stated on the bottle because I just use it from a, a larger container and I just decant it in for the pump. Like with the, the pressure tester, we've got the adapter on there. Like I say, we're going to fill it from the bottom to the top, it purges all the air out as we go. So it can be a little bit fiddly if it's in a, a tub like this holding oil. But we'll uh, do our best to get it in. There we go, that's it in. And now it's just a case of pumping. Pumping away on this on the oil pump until we get gear oil coming out the top of the vent, which is then when we know it's full. Now as you can see, as I'm pumping there, we're just getting the, the bit of oil out. What we do now, put the plug in the top, remove the lower one and put the lower plug back in. And that's the gearbox oil changed. So I've just put the top plug back in and now it's just a case of removing the lower one. So I'm just going to unwind this. Put the new plug on standby here. Try not to drop oil onto the ground. Get that plug in as quick as we can. There we go. Let's get it started there. Get the screwdriver. Wind it in. And we'll clean up all that oil and snug it down properly. So we have it, lower ones in and the upper one, let us say, we'll clean off all the oil and then snug them up. Right, so one of the last jobs we're going to do now with this service is reinstall the propeller. Put some grease onto the drive shaft, onto the prop shaft here. We've got the propeller, be it a damaged one. Line the spines up, that goes on like that. And we've got the the spacer which goes on. And finally the castle nut. Which goes down as well. Also we'll nip that up with the socket and then there's a split pin which goes through the prop shaft itself, securing the castle nut to the shaft. Prevents the nut backing out and the prop coming off. So for tightening, see, we always use a bit of wood. Got a 19mm socket onto the castle there. Just nip it down. What we're looking for is if you see in there, I don't know how clear it's going to be, but on the prop shaft there's a, a tapping drill hole where the split pin goes through. And what we want to do is align the cotter pin, sorry not the cotter pin, align the castle, um, what do you call it, a crenellation with the hole so we can get the, the split pin, cotter pin through. 
if you can see on that one, but that one needs a little bit more. That'll do. See there, the uh, the holes are aligned. We we'll just select the right size pin to go through. Try that one. Yep, we don't want one too small, so it falls through. Get the pliers, and we just pull back one of the tails of the cotter pin, and then just push it over on itself. Push that bit down. As you can see there, it's not going to back out now. And that's it. Secured. Once it's fitted, just give it a rotation. Just make sure you haven't nipped up too much. So that's the lower unit and power head all serviced. And the last thing to do is to grease all the linkages up on the top and any pivot points as well. There we go. Got the engine running. Put it in the water tank. It did take some starting though. I had to sort of pre-fill the chambers with some uh, carb cleaner and give it a spray down the throat of the, of the carburetor. Once it's running, it's running nice. As you can hear, I'm running on a remote tank there, 50 to 1 mixture. Got good coolant coming out of it. Another thing you can see, the customer didn't give me his kill cord, so all I've done is disconnect the ignition, which goes to this, this pack here. It just puts the ignition coil to ground, so in an emergency, I just touch the two wires together on the other end. Yeah, it's running really nice. So we'll just check the gearing ahead now. Got the engine running ahead. That's a neutral there. Quite worried about getting the tank in case the clock hits the actual tank. Obviously, as any test run, we're looking for leaks. Anything that shouldn't be coming out of anywhere, it shouldn't be. Like a couple of thermostat housing. Nice and dry, it's getting warm as well, which is a good sign. Especially looking for leaks on the fuel filter. But it all seems good. And there it is after its test run. I don't know if you could hear me on the test run with the uh, sound of the engine, but what I was saying was we were just checking for leaks around fuel filters, thermostat covers. We're looking for the coolant coming out the bottom of the telltale. We'll check the gearing, forward or stern. So as always, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, please subscribe and like the video. And I hope you've learned something. If you've got one of these engines, like a Mariner 30 or a Tahatsu 30, and hopefully if you've been stuck at any point or just wanted some assistance, you've learned something. Thanks for watching.